about structure, because it turns out that underneath every play or movie, most television episodes, there is one essential structure, there's one backbone. Um, and if you know this pattern, if you know the structure, not only can you write plays and movies, but you can analyze the plays and movies of others. So I am terrified of needles. Because of that, I have no tattoos. If I had a tattoo, however, it would be of this. It looks really boring, but to a writer, this is the most important thing in the world, specifically to a writer of movies or of plays, because this line is the structure of every great movie or play. It is a variation on that uh, dramatic structure that we talk about with uh, short stories in English, but you see it looks a little bit different. Let me grab my marker. Sorry about that. So this line is the structure of the play, and it represents the journey of the protagonist. Like we said in the video on conflict, a play has to have conflict, or Aegon, therefore it's got to have a proto-Aegon in it, a protagonist, someone who drives the Aegon forward, someone who wants something enough to get into all that conflict that we're interested in. And in a play, this is the path that the protagonist follows. They start down here, happy little protagonist, he has a smile, a couple eyes, um, and for the first part of it, things aren't going too bad. It's pretty flat. This lasts a very short amount of time compared to the whole play. We call this part the stasis, because uh, it's stable, not too much is happening. Um, during that time, we get to know the characters, we get to know the world, uh, we have exposition where we set up what's happened beforehand, but the plot hasn't really started yet. The plot starts here, and we call this moment the inciting incident. The inciting incident. And all of this means, it's a fancy word, for the moment at which the protagonist suddenly sees what they want. Suddenly they want something. So the want is introduced at that moment. And like we said, wants are important. Wants drive characters into action. So the big want is introduced here. Um, in Oedipus, this happens really early on. Oedipus comes out on stage and says, oh, I know something's wrong, don't worry. I, I've sent someone to find out the reason. Next thing we know, Creon's coming back and he says, okay, there's a murderer in Thebes. Suddenly we know what the want is. I want to catch the murderer in Thebes. And that happens in the first ten minutes or so uh, of the play. In virtually every movie, there's going to be a moment like this. In a romantic comedy, it's the moment where the guy meets the girl. They're going on, and about 10, maybe 15 minutes into the movie, they meet one another. One of them, if not both of them, fall in love. They may not realize it yet, but we realize it in the audience, and they suddenly have a want. I want true love in the form of that person that I just met. Um, in uh, most violent movies, the want is either revenge or to get something, uh, to rob the bank. In every movie, in every play, there's a want, and it's established here. Now that the protagonist wants something, they've got to try and get it. Um, because in a good play or a good movie, that's not easy. If it were easy, there'd be no conflict. Um, this is what we call driving action. So the protagonist has to work harder and harder and come up against more and more obstacles they try to get that thing. And every step the character takes forward to try and get that thing, a new obstacle shows up. Um, and that's what makes it interesting. We call that the rising action. Um, and that makes up the majority of the action in the play. But finally, uh, it gets to this point at the top, which we call, of course, the climax. And the climax in a play or movie is a little bit different than a short story. In a short story, you might say the climax is the turning point, for example. In a play or a movie, the climax is very simply the moment at which the protagonist gets what they want or not. At the climax, they either get what they want or they don't get what they want. Um, and another way to say this is that a question has been asked back here at the inciting incident. Is this character going to get this thing that they want? And we can say the climax is the moment when that's answered. And the answer is always either yes or no. Yes, they get it, or no.
though they don't? If the answer is maybe, that's not the climax. Um, in fact, a lot of writers fall into this trap of writing plays, um, and then they just sort of end, they don't really go anywhere. You may have seen plays like this, you may have seen movies like this. And now you can see what the problem was. Either a strong want wasn't established at the beginning, or it wasn't made clear at the end whether they got it or not. So it was either missing the inciting incident or the climax. And you've got to have those two things, otherwise the play feels mushy. Um, but if you do have those things, it will be taut and clear uh, and, and very, very sharp. So here at the beginning, inciting incident, a want is established, protagonist tries to get it, other things happen, there's plenty of other characters, they may have wants as well, but they are secondary to the protagonist and his or her wants. And then the climax, they either get it or they don't. And then following that, this bit, the following action, is really short because audiences are impatient. We want to get home. Now that we know whether the character got what they wanted or they didn't, there's no more reason for us to stay in the theater, so we want to get home. So that folly action is really short, sort of like the exposition here. Actually, it's shorter than the exposition of Stay Six here because uh, we're much more impatient. So those are the important things to keep in mind about a play. It's going to have a stasis to set things up, an inciting incident where suddenly there's a want, um, a rising action that forms the bulk of the play as the protagonist tries to get what they want, the climax where they have to get it or they don't, and then the following action, the resolution. A couple of small things. Another way we can say this, as I said, there's a way that this is a question that's being planted in the audience's mind. Is the character going to get what they want or not? That question is so important we give it a name. We call it the major dramatic question. Or if we get lazy, we can just call it the MDQ. And all it is is that statement, will the protagonist get the thingy? And the thingy is whatever they want. So for every play, every movie, there is a major dramatic question like this. Will the protagonist get the thingy? Will the guy get the girl? Or will the girl get the guy in a romantic comedy? Will Oedipus get the murderer? in the city of these. No matter what movie or play it is, if it's well made, it's got one of these. And it's always very, very simple, very sort of first grade simple. Will X get Y? That's what we call the major dramatic question. It is posed here, and it is answered here. And like I said, the answer is always yes or no. Will Oedipus get the murderer in Thebes? Answer, yes. Now, it's a tragedy, so in answering yes, all this other horrible stuff happens, but that's secondary to the main, the major dramatic question. So, that's another way of establishing the structure. But no matter how big or small a play or a movie is, whether it's a ten-minute play like the ones you're going to be writing, or whether it's a big, gigantic two- or three-hour play or opera, it's always going to follow this structure. Sometimes, um, with very, uh, sort of, uh, avant-garde and experimental directors, they may chop this up and scoot the pieces around, but if you look at any successful player movie, underneath you're going to find this line in some form or another. It's the most important thing that you can know 